We would like to extend a welcome to this session about religion and social stability. And we extend a special welcome to the members of our panel for today. We first of all have Dr. Carlos Alvarado Coriza. He is from Guatemala, and he is the rector of the University of San Carlos. And before this, he served as the general secretary of the same university, which is, I believe, the oldest one in Guatemala and one of the very first in America. We also have Father Ramon de la Cruz Valdera from the Dominican Republic. He is currently the rector of the Pontificia Universidad Católica Madre y Maestra. He received his doctorate in theology from the University of Friedrich in Germany. And we would like to extend a welcome to Tomás Enríquez Carrera, who is from Chile. He is the founder of the Comunidad y Justicia, which is a NGO that is dedicates itself to the protection of human rights in Chile through legislature and law. He received his degree from the University of Pontificia Universidad Católica of Chile and a doctorate in legal study, international legal studies and human rights from the University of Georgetown. Just so you know, I have been told that we can perhaps extend this meeting until 3.05, so I will make sure that we're aware of the time. I'm going to give you a notification when you have five minutes left and one more reminder when you have one minute left so that you can all be aware of your time. All right, thank you. Bueno, muy buenas tardes. En primer lugar, quiero agradecer a las distinguidas autoridades de la universidad y a quienes nos han invitado, a los organizadores de este simposio. Quiero agradecer en nombre de la Universidad de San Carlos esa invitación para compartir con cada uno de ustedes, compañeras y compañeros honorables de los distintos países que, nos represent que estamos representando este día. Quiero primeramente hablarles sobre lo que es la Universidad de San Carlos brevemente para que ustedes tengan claridad de lo que es y lo que significa una institución como la Universidad de San Carlos, que es la única universidad pública en Guatemala. Eh, me acompaña, quiero presentar al secretario general de la universidad, al doctor Carlos Enrique Camey Rodas, que nos acompaña el día de hoy. Vamos a hacer una breve reseña institucional y luego vamos a entrar a las reflexiones. And then we're going to do a brief uh, introduction and the uh, things and the overview. The University of San Carlos it has 336 years. It was founded on January 31st, on 1676. The only is the only public university of Guatemala, like I said before, and besides 14 private universities that we have in our country. So we have 15 university, and the University of San Carlos is the only public one. In the university, uh, there is about um, there's about about 58. 0.6% a total of inscriptions or enroll 58.6% and it is in our university imagine imagine what this university has in Guatemala when it comes to superior education I'll, I'll, as well 80% of the 80% of the students are doing their doctorate degrees and their masters and it covers uh, 20 out of the 22 departments in Guatemala, 
we do have extensions, but we don't have a universe. Um, you know, we don't have any other extended centers. The, cons the Constitution, the Constitution tells that there is is found in Article 82. It gives the only the only juridistic personality, and in its character, is the only university that they exclusively can direct, organize, and develop and develop the education. And Article 84 is the budget for the University of Guatemala that it been given an assignment and according to the Constitution is not less than 5% from the general income that comes. And I just saw your just saw your expressions, and I got to tell you that I mean, it's the budget. You know, it's nev we never get the five percent. It says it says five percent, but in reality, we never get it. Each government they apply it in a different way. They start to doing all kinds of discounts, even some of those. After all the discounts, you know, then they give us the 5% that they are supposed to give us. And, but some governments, they have complied with it. We have more than 125,000 students, 225,000. We have 39 uh, facilities in which 20 are uni uh so 20 of them are centers for the university, and they are in the entire different parts of the country. We have two technological institutes, and this is the offer that we have for the university. We have 106 different careers. We have 47 that they can do it in teaching, 51 in technicals, 56 in different specialties, 174 masters, and 16 doctorate. So we have a total of 450 careers. This is algo very fundamental, and that's why I wanted to teach you and let you know what it is. The University of San Carlos is the only one that I think, I don't know any other university unless that you guys can tell me that it has a direct representation when it comes into the, the state in different areas that we probably don't know about. For example, we have, we have someone that represents in the court which is the highest court. We also have uh, the director, which is me, and I participate in the election of the magistrate in the Supreme Court and also in the appealing of courts. Also, we have a representation of five, of five people that are there, that are that are always there, and they, we have another five that are there to substitute in case they need it in the areas, uh, in the social areas, which are the ones that also help us out with the monetary uh, incidents that we have. But these are some of the things that I can mention. We have more than 78 representations all over the place. They are very important. And the University of San Carlos have a very important thing. And it's the only university that I know that it has the initiative of the law. In Guatemala, they only have four institutions, four initiatives, the Congress of the Republic, the President, which is the executive, and the, and the course, which is the electoral, and also the University of San Carlos. We can generate initiatives before the law, and we present them to the Congress of the Republic. And of course, we have the only public university. We have a great commitment with our Guatemalan society through the through the supervised exercises in a professional way, such as internships. And right here is talking about the laboratory for the production of uh, medica medications. And also, there is a there, they have a school where they produce medication that is being used for, for example, an IV fluids that is being used in all the hospitals in the country.
In like that, some other aspects that the university contribute to the citizens, uh, and it's a very low, low cost. For example, the IV fluid at the pharmacy is 12 quetzales. It's a dollar and change, and we give it to three quetzales. Now, let's, let's ponder about some of the things today. I would like to start with the history of the country, of a family, or perhaps or a social group. It is full of controversies that are being that they start with different reasons. This has made the human men to find the ways on how to co coexist as a species in order to win the battle against violence before they take their lives. Is, the, is humanity in crisis? Of course. The human being is a product and a production of culture, regardless of the knowledge that they have and also not having the sufficient communication and struggling every day to survive and try to over overpass the dominion or over things and over and over or challenges that they have, they have to deal with all these issues within their daily life. Now with individualism and all the other thing and the technology that takes them away from the world, but it also it links them with a lot of information that not necessarily it becomes of a knowledge of the users, but instead is taking them to a doubts, to doubts that are in society, especially in the practices in practices in the social area. Los principios, the principles, the values, and the ethic, until they get to the framework, they are social products and sons and daughters, or perhaps, you know, milestones or every season. And also of the forms of organizations that are socially in order to satisfy the needs of humans. Humanity, they have defined religions and laws and the, and the, and the politic systems as they walk through Earth. However, in every period that they develop, they recognize the divine and the faith that's been given. He has oriented the way that people behave in order to find patterns to live in a very civilized way. Nowadays, also the market, right now the market has gone to places without discrimination. The evidence that we have is something very important that shows the freedom to practice the different types of religions, that it goes from the Catholic Church all the way to others that have taken some people's lives. Now, at this moment, in this humanity that we live right now, some religious practices, they prohibit the individualism and also selfishness. And that's what breaks, that breaks that link that we have with society. Perhaps the contemporary civilizations, they do live. And then they're saying, well, help yourself. Do what you can do. But however, we have to sacrifice our fellow men if necessary. Ahora, leaving the kids and elderly people, it pretty much is, obstruct, is an obstruction in order to go ahead with all the things that we need to do in life. Why? Because sometimes there is things that are very materialistic and what's complicated is that the dignity of humanity gets lost. Now, the faith, faith will help us bring harmony. If it's broken, it puts at risk all the community and the people around that, which is the family. Religion helps the conduct of a human to be in communion with individuals that they live around with. 
and it may give you the collectively salvation. Instead of dividing us, the religion should be guiding us to find those channels of communication in, in how understand the world, its origin, its development, its transformation. However, when the values of social life has been lost, then what happens is the religions become an excuse in order to confront others, to develop hate, and to start a war against our fellow men. And in the country that I come, it is basically, so the cultures, what we have, it becomes a war among the cultures. Why? Because the pre-Hispanic countries in in about the 15th century in Guatemala, they became a problem with the Catholic Church because of the colonial times. The experience of the dialogues in Guatemala it facilitates that it may exist the economic system, which it does help in order to promote the religions that are found in our country. And that is very important for us. Another example is uh, that I want to tell you about is a work uh, interreligious, and I I call it the group of the four, or G4 that is called in Guatemala. This is a space in where the academy and human rights and all the predominant churches in and this is a. Uh, and this is by the director of the University of San Carlos, the Attorney General and the Evangelic Alliance leader and the Metropolitan Art, 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 Arts of Bishop. And there is a role, very a determinant role that constitute at this moment in the almost prophetic voice that alert all the state leaders and the strategic sectors of the main problems that affects peace and affects all the people, of course, and of course their dignity. Uh, now, from San Carlos, from this university, and in this advancement that has happened in Guatemala with G4, in November of last year, G4 was pronounced, it was pronounced from an as research, and I want to tell you, a manifest to you, that everything that it was given in that document in November of 2014, it became true after April 16, 2015. Those manifestations, you know them. In reality, they have been very important in our country and that it finished the ex-president and former president that are in function right now and they are in jail right now. I wish I would have talked to you a little bit more, but I'm going to talk a little bit more before I finished of the national platform for the reform of the state, G4 has been the lens that has credibility and hope in Guatemala. So I have I have a lot of faith in this, and it has been formed by the four institutions. But the University of Juan Carlos, through, because they hadn't been heard by the popular voice, they come and according to the things that they bring and to pass all and all these problems and they pretty much raise their voice to the platform of the nation, national platform we thought that some organizations were going to attend to this particular uh, meeting but this uh, everyone in this platform is about 229 organizations that are actually part of it and that includes all kinds of people that is being represented, the professional colleges, universities, uh, research centers, indigenous people, I mean, the, sec the private sector, um, any type of organizations that comes from students, uh, from the states, from peasants, from uh, from the environment. I mean, uh, there's a total of 229 organizations that they have been part of our university. This is a very important forum, very fundamental, that there is a lot of credibility and hope of what we're doing. 
and we analyze all the reforms the, of the different laws, especially, you know, that we're, that we're in, a, in a presidency um, time right now that we are going to have to elect again. And we have been working hard to reform the law and with the political parties that the Congress has actually pay attention to it. But before we came, we presented once again our petitions to the electoral law, and I'm going to mention four or five aspects that are fundamental. One, no. So if a party gets elected, they have to finish their four years as a congressman or as a mayor in that particular party, or pretty much, you know, just quit. Another one is the is, is re-election which is another four years. And the financial theme in Guatemala, unfortunately, you know, there is too much movement when it comes to financial matters. So, so we are trying to get a law where there might be a limit in order to finance all these political parties and it could be the same for committees and for other parties. And another topic that is a controversy with the media is time. It's time that it should be given to everyone in an equal basis. And the last one is that they may participate, including those political parties and committees that they may bring the topic of women, women and men, also the participation of 70% of youth, and that's why I'm very happy that the, the Congress, congressmen here of Costa Rica, that they are young, and it's been fundamental in this particular fight in Guatemala, and he has had a lot of participation and responsibility, and we are proposing this law so so they may have a certain percentage in the youth. So this platform, this national platform, is going to continue after the elections and the political party. We are going to propose some other changes, like the law of uh, hiring, which is going to uh, present it, perhaps uh, civil service, and some other topics that are fundamental. So they may see that there's going to be a change of the political area, and you also know what is happening. But also, we are thinking in working with a more just and worthy country. Thank you. Good afternoon to each and every one of you. I would like to, first of all, thank Mr. Kimball and Mr. Rafael Gutierrez, who extended this invitation to me from this university, university to participate in this important symposium. I promise you, and first of all, I give you permission to sleep for, during these 10 minutes, and I promise to wake you up when I'm done. I would like to speak somewhat about the relationship uh, between the church and the state in the Dominican Republic and how our university in response to the church has participated in the resolution of conflicts in our country. Hearing the different expositions from our colleagues in Latin America about the constitution of each one of their countries, we realize that each one of them, except for a few, mention the Catholicism that took place and the recognition of the Catholic Church and then their respect 
of the freedom of religion of its people. In order to be able to understand this, and specifically the case of the Dominican Republic, without a doubt, we have to go back to our, the people that colonized us in 1492, which historically meant, and from the point of view of anthropology, and religious sociology, on which I would like to base my arguments, which means what the encounter between our indigenous people and the Europeans had expanded and opened up the world to us. We, as Latin Americans, now had a new vision that there were other people in this world and that there were other continents. Another important point is the moment that the col colonizers from Spain arrived, led by an Italian. And that was the expulsion of the last Muslim and Jews from Spain. In January of 1492, this expulsion battle took place. Therefore, those that arrived at our country, the Dominican Republic, firstly were marked by this time of Christianity. When Christopher Columbus arrived, he was he was the representative of the Pope when he arrived in our lands. He not only represented the crown, but he also represented the church. This process of evangelization took place during the second trip of Christopher Columbus, in which they brought well-formed clerics. That is an advantage that we had in Latin America, particularly in the Caribbean islands. The church officials that arrived were academics that tried to teach what they had learned in their various universities. Many of them were actually great professors. The cross arrived with Columbus and Christianity had arrived. During this process of evangelization of the Indian or indigenous people, Christian, Christianity was accepted in two ways, either voluntarily or by obligation or forced. I either accept it freely to be Christian. If not, I would be forced. The indigenous people were forced to it go to Mass. We know, because of history, that 40 years later, after Christopher Columbus arrived to the Dominican Republic, there were only about 600 Aborigines that were left, and there are still some obscure facts that in 1492, there were between 2 and 3 million Aborigines, and in 40 years, there were only 600 left. During this mission of evangelization, the universities arose in 1538. We founded the University of Santo Tomás Aquino by the Fathers Dominicus. This tradition continues. Today in the Dominican Republic, there are seven Catholic universities, two of evangelical denominations, and three that are secular, but within their halls, they permit religious practices, and some of them do have churches inside them. What else affected the fact that the Dominican people have, have recognized church and state? These first church leaders that had arrived were pro-life. And the sermon of Father Montesinos in 1511, there was a new period in the history of this relationship. In his discourse, Ego Clamanti Vox in Deserto, which means that he is the voice of God that speaks from the desert. This sermon 
donde los aborígenes son considerados it spoke of how aborigines were then granted their human rights. Another important aspect in, in terms of the black race, speaking of Bartolomé de las Casas, in order to avoid that the indigenous people continue to die, brought Africans from the Congo, and they are also forced to practice Catholicism. And this was done, in, one, because it was a matter of survival. Africans had in their homes Catholic images. When a missionary would come, they would immediately hang it up. And when they left, they would hang up their own gods. And this brought a conflict that it, to this day continues to be applied. During the process of independence, Catholicism is still present with the participation of Christians. So the, pay, the symbols of the state of the Dominican Republic are marked by the religious affiliation that yesterday my brother Mariano Germán spoke of in his ex exposition. The shield with God, country, and liberty. The flag with the cross. And it says that, that you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And now to jump what is to speak about the Concord of 1544 signed between the dictator Trujillo because this is a case that up until this day is still discussed when we speak of the relationship between the church and the state. The first article, it says the ap apostolic Roman religion continues to be the religion of the Republican nation, the Dominican Republican nation, and shall enjoy the rights and prerogatives in accordance with divine law and canon law. Here, the church assumes its role as the thing that gives social stability to the state. And at the end of this government in 1971, there was a tension between church and state, which in which a bishop would protest against dictatorship, his church would be burned down, and six months later, the dictator fell. After that, in the Dominican Republic, there was a belief that any government that opposes the church would fall. How have we contributed to this stability? There must be a relationship of respect. There must be active participation within the various institutions, and the church is a mediator in social conflicts that is done through the Center for Resolution of Conflicts that is within our university. The Pontificia University carries or is the leader in resolving problems, especially when it comes to political problems. And we have avoided large conflicts because of this center of conflict resolution. Also, within our university, there is a council for economic stabilization of the Dominican Republic, where a priest is head of this council, and he provides counsel to the politicians when it comes to matters of economy. And this priest is the only one in the country that has an official state job in order to hold this call. What are the perspectives going forward, or what are the threats, the growing uh, separation of church and state, voices that are calling for this separation, or the secular state, trends to remove all religious things from public space, what are their opportunities? There's increased awareness of the Christian life, increased sense of eucharism, organization of non-Catholic Christian churches, because of the new constitution of 2010, where participation is granted and it is called for regulation of state 
particularly when it comes to those things related to marriage, which has both value civilly and religiously. Until 2010, those marriages performed in churches that were non-Catholic were not recognized. There's also participation of Christians in the media. It's more and more active, and the opening for the young to this religious phenomenon, which makes it so that the state must recognize all churches so that they can continue to work towards stabilization of our country. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for being here. Thank you for the BYU University. Uh, they asked me to talk about, about the non-governmental um, institutions and how to preserve the, the right of, uh, or the freedom of religion here in the American continent. Well, my experience as an attorney, uh, which is the reason my comments, they'll have to be taken in my respective as an attorney, someone that has been dedicated, especially to the things that they have could in order to preserve the right of expression, the freedom of religion, and in my own country. Also, my experience comes from the litigation in Chile, and they have to be with my country, but it maybe applies to the other American uh, countries. I wanted to change the presentation. I was really tempted, especially uh, listening to the many good ones that they have been given. And, you know, uh, the words from Dr. Howery, they've been spinning around because in Latin America, we have uh, strong states and weak people, and I think that is so true, and that's why we live in Latin America, that our states can be very powerful, and society, they have a little bit of participation in the defense of their own freedoms. Now, uh, as a preamble to my comments, what do I mean by religious beliefs? I think what we have heard in this past two days, they give testimony that in reality there is not a, a discussion that the freedom of religion is asking that the state does not become in a forceful way and tell us that we need to believe in this or that. And that is basically, that's the minimum that we need to, where we can start. However, on the other hand, in Latin America, is something that is already resolved, and we can say it in peace that in any state, this could be a topic to talk about, but also that could give you a false trust. And that way we can think that that's the freedom of religion is already secure, but it's not. However, when we take a further step and we ask, so what's the next step in order to get the freedom of religion for every person? We don't have any agreement on what is the power that that particular uh, firm has. And I'm talking about in which the state tries to limit or try to impose the conduct to a certain person and also specifically in respect with the believer has to violate or break their conscience. We have had opposition in this symposium like the, the one from Australia. Obviously, we don't have an agreement on which one is the appropriate equilibrium in to exercise the discrimination and the freedom of religion. And that's very clear. And to my judgment, that is the conflict more severe that is growing in Latin America or at least here in my country and it is very considerable in society, we don't understand that we see this particular need to practice this freedom of religion because I've always had it. But sometimes we rule it out because sometimes we believe that it can become something that we are going to reclaim. But no, uh, so sometimes, you know, there might not be an oppression when it comes to that. But sometimes I ask, how can this is not a, how can this is something that we shouldn't be talking about? And I think that we've been talking about this, especially with the conscience and the practices. 
con las cuales obviamente no which, um, partiendo, por ejemplo, con la for example, uh, the cooperation between good and bad, like it's an abortion or sexually orientation or conduct with adultery or having sex with the same gender. Also, um, talking about the education for the children, if the education is totally different than the freedom of religion, that it's uh, violating something and it has to be treated in the same way instead of a separate way, and they enjoy both. Now, that particular right to their children is it's a threat in a lot of ways, in a lot of aspects, depending on the ed sex education class, because it's a phenomenon that all the American countries are facing, and it's not just about teaching orient sex orientation, but there is also that also what they're trying to impose and to teach the the identity of a gender or same attraction gender and so forth. But sometimes, you know, I find people from the Congress that are here present, perhaps the possibility that they may take to their countries that they can take this as a incitation in a different country as a hate a discussion and sometimes you know that's what we talk about and we try we're trying not to impose this but sometimes in 2013 i believe that this was adopted it hasn't been ratified but it is a danger for american for latin america where are these problems coming from fundamentally uh, from the local governments national the congress and i also will say um, and I think it was from the Court of Human Rights, which has moved in recent years from its previous phase. Why? Because we can come to find out how these issues have gone on the first phase, and that they did good in our American, uh, in Latin American continent, but also on the second phase, we can call an ideology in which there is an advance to impose with no absolute discrimination, it will try, it, it probably will not let you use, uh, you to rationalize and perhaps, you know, the abortion and, uh, and to violate the law of the conscience. And everything has come from this different court, the American Court of Human Rights. And it has only issued one decision decided specifically on religion freedom grounds. But instead, the court has issued a growing amount of decisions on non-discriminatory many of which are born. So, for example, there's only one case that has been referred to the freedom of religion. And even like that, just to see, and what are you doing, you know, then we come and find another scenario where a president doesn't find a lot of comfort when it comes to the freedom of religion. Now, my mission working from the government point of view is to pretty much uh, to keep the rights of the believers and not to violate or trespass their trust and to and also include all those particular cultural areas and we can see that this is happening on a daily basis especially with the human ecology I'm talking about the abortion the families in general or what we could call the sexual moral values and also the non-government facilities that are maybe some of them are involved and I want to say vigilance and vigilance. Why is it vigilance? Why should we have that? Because we need to have a better knowledge and maybe awareness because there is more, we're more aware of stuff, and especially what's going on in our country. Now when there's changes, de igual manera, it, did, it doesn't happen because of an invisible force that it moves. It's a product of what humans do. So all the changes in the legislature that we have seen, they have done there or catalyzed by a human force that has been in that particular area. And in my experience, I've seen organizations that are non-government and they have made those changes. And it's been the result in our countries because of interest or because of activists that they have proven and proven to push all this interest. And they have been able to um, make it look good before everybody. At the same time, let's make conscious of how these things are changing and also we can probably get a diagnostic of how we can prevent future results that it might be the other way around. Um, also, there is, we have a, uh, we have something that there's two things that provokes. We have Artavia case and Atala. So at the same time, 
we are affected in Latin America because of the pollinization that has been transferred. And at the same time, these presidents here, they are taking them to their own Congress or to their own court. And also, they come to find out that they impose these things like if it was a human right, which is not, which I question all the time. And that's how it is in the Convention Against Discrimination and Intolerance. However, um, I will ask, I will, the second is the action. I mean, we will have to do that. We need to do that. We have had conversation with a lot of people here on the symposium that they have had a lot of things, that they have mobilized themselves to the different families and to different religions, but instead against it. Uh, now, my answer is, um, is this. The groups are, are considered to be in the religion that they may allow people to enter in the temples in their homes, but but you know what? It's not like that. And some of them, they have. They have had a plan with coordination, with dedication, and then I would say being professional in order to push these particular agendas. And at the end, is someone that has to be very concluded, has to be very clean, and they are formed in the popular culture so people can accept it and we represent it publicly. And then, in their respective, there is nothing else. We can define it in the courts or in the Congress or in the media. And then, you know, we are leaving the entire field open so others can come and push their interests. Specifically, when it comes to action, uh, it is possible that we need to take charge of what we've done. I think the organizations from not the governments are fundamental. If they don't exist, then we should create them. And that's my conclusion that I think that is more relevant that I'm trying to portray to you, that we, if we want to promote the religion, let's do it. And let's do it. And if those organizations don't exist, let's create them. So we may put people that they are dedicated and that they, and that we may go to war and be able against this legislature or this government or this Congress. So, because we have them, but they don't, they don't make any good. I mean, they don't do any good if they're just sitting there. Now, I have against two directors here of universities and that I think about what will happen here in the United States, that they generate clinics, that they promote the freedom of religion or the freedom of expression, and then translate that mission and dedication into participate actively in cases that there is things of justice that need to be promoted around the world. Now, I'm thinking about my country, I think we have something that's fundamental, and these are the universities that I have contact with. It's not a topic, it is something that we could work on, and it will be very important in the society in order to defend the freedoms. Also, it is very important that they could be some common ground in order for the freedom of religion. Why? Because it's as states, we do not strength the common grounds with religion, then we are leaving the open door, like I said, so it can be defined in other terms. Right now, the court, like I mentioned before, they have not been able to touch different topics because there hasn't been that particular talk and also, you know, there's probably going to become, sooner or later, there's going to be a conflict here and a conflict there. And before that particular scenario, the court has something else that is called non-discriminatory that does not allow any intervention that might be discriminatory, but there's nothing about the freedom of religion. So the states and the public, we are trying to interpret the Com American Convention on how it happened and how it will happen in the court. And when the verdict comes, the ones that are affected is us. Finally, and like I said, one of the threats that are more important right now to the freedom of religion is our own continent. It has to be with the convention, with the discrimination, because it doesn't matter how good the intention might be or the instrument that we need to use or the practice that it generates, we have to generate a new human right that it could come and give the, everyone the possibility to be protected by the state against any manifestation or acts that is not tolerant. And it is very extensive, it is very 
I mean, it's just so big that it can allow any type of incident. And right here in Latin America, we know that those instruments that are present and that are open to abuse, they could be used just for that. And we have to be more vigilant to that. If there is something that you can take out of my brief presentation, it will be that, that you may take conscience of these threats that are available and especially about this discrimination, about resistance, study it, and at the same time, oppose yourself, be against it. The Congress, the courts, speaking with your own government, but if it's not us from the civil area, nobody else is going to act upon it. Thank you. Okay. In order to get to the last session, we're not going to have time for question and answers, but I would like to thank the members of the panel for their excellent and edifying presentations. Please express your gratitude one more time.